On this small Hebridean island in Scotland, Columba and his twelve followers began to build their monastery. Perhaps as a sign of lowliness, they built it not from stone, but of hewn timbers, thatched with reeds, of which no trace remains today. It is very difficult now to visualize Iona without the great buildings of the restored Benedictine Abbey which overlies the heart of Columbus settlement. However, we do have the evidence of excavation showing both rectangular and circular buildings. But large or small, those buildings were made of timber. The painted shingles shown in the Book of Kells temptation scene seem to be based on reality. If taken together with this little stone building known as Columba's Shrine, perhaps we come close to the spirit of 6th century Iona. Many of the churches of the early medieval period were of wood and some of them were quite large. We know that in one case, at least, the church of Kildare in the 7th century, uh, it was decorated with paintings. Of course they would have had altars, and on the altars, at least for the celebration of the Mass, there would have been the sacred vessels. It was most important to have the chalice of the wine, the pattern for the bread, and the book for the readings. Though, if the Book of Kells was used in the celebration of the Mass, I very much doubt if it was regularly used for readings. We tend to think of the Irish church as very austere, because the surviving stone churches are very simple. They're located in isolated, out-of-the-way places. The sea is a brooding place. From it, at the end of time, the apocalyptic beast will arise to bring destruction to mankind. No place is more isolated than the rocks of Skellig Michael off the coast of Kerry. Here, Irish monks built their bleak monastic outpost. They named this awesome place after the Archangel Michael, who defeated Satan. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, Christ commanded his disciples to take the Gospel to the ends of the earth. Irish commentators saw their own conversion as directly, literally fulfilling this command because they were living at the very edge of the old Roman Empire. Indeed, they were living beyond ocean, which marked its edge. The Irish monks took this need for refuge and isolation from the desert fathers of the early Eastern Church. Saint Anthony and Saint Paul, who lived out their lives in the sands of Egypt in outposts. At night, demons came to Antony and shook his dwelling like an earthquake. Their likeness was of wild beasts and creeping things, with heads of roaring lions and writhing serpents who gnashed their teeth upon him. But the Lord forgot him not and set a ray of light upon him. And so the demons vanished and Antony's building was made whole again. Saint Anthony is the father of all monks through all the whole world and this is the first monastery in the world. It goes back to 1600 years ago. One miracle in the lives of the two saints particularly fascinated both the monks in Ireland and in the land of the Picts in Scotland. Every day, Paul was fed in his mountain cave by a raven who brought him half a loaf of bread. 
As his life drew to an end, Antony crossed the mountains to visit him, whereupon the raven flew in with a whole loaf of bread, and they pondered together who should eat it first. Many carvings of this moment exist, but the finest example is found on the Nig stone in the highlands of Scotland. The narrative of the miracle of the bringing of the bread is exploited to become an actual representation of the Eucharist with the breaking of the bread taking place above a chalice and Paul and Antony not sitting conversing but enacting the rites of the priest with their mass books on either side of the chalice. Mm -hmm. There are some connections to be made between the art of the High Crosses in Ireland and the Book of Kells. But the best sculptural comparisons for the art of the Book of Kells are to be found on carved stones in Scotland, particularly those which have examples of the so-called snake boss motif. Is there perhaps one other uncanny connection between the many Irish High Crosses and the East? Could Christ's cross and scepter have been inspired by Osiris, the sun god of the ancient Egyptians, holding his Ankh, the symbol of eternal life? St. Columba was a scribe because of his great status as a saint and his great reputation as a monastic founder. He gave a great status to scribes in the early Irish monastic church particularly. And uh, his successor was a scribe and Adafnan, who wrote his life and so on, was also known as a scribe. And in the early Irish church as well, the word scribe had the same connotations as it has for the Hebrew in that the scribe is not just a, a man who can write, but one who is a learned man, learned in the law and learned in the scripture. St. Columba, at the end of his life, on the very last day, he was actually writing a psalm book. And he was finishing the 33rd psalm when he died. The last words he wrote were, in quirentes autem dominum, non deficient omni bono. Those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. One of the earliest examples of Irish calligraphy are some psalms that are written on a set of wax tablets that were discovered in a bog. The style of writing that Columba used is nowadays referred to as the insular style, and it's a handwriting style that developed in the islands, Ireland, England and Scotland. It was quite well developed by 600, as can be seen in the Cock. The Cahawk is the earliest surviving insular manuscript and it's a book of psalms. It was further refined and perfected in the book of Doro a hundred years later and then it reached its perfection in the book of Kells. The book of Kells, which probably dates from around 800, is a glorious culmination of a whole series of manuscripts. 